Hi, welcome to the Sigma Pad. I have a pretty interesting episode for you guys, and this all has to do with me wanting to generate millimeter wave frequencies and analyze millimeter wave frequencies here in the lab. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you know that we have extensive measurement capability here in the lab, up to about 26 and a half gigahertz. For example, the MXA, which I have reviewed and done kind of a teardown for as well, can measure signals up to 26 and a half gigahertz without any issues. It has a 110 gigahertz real-time analysis band with tons of different features and software options. So really extensive measurements are possible. And if you tie that with the S-series oscilloscope, which is sitting right on top of it, which I've also done a review and tear down of. And then the together you can even analyze wider bandwidth signals because this has a wide band IF output which you can feed into this scope that has eight gigahertz of bandwidth and you can analyze up to two gigahertz or so real time and um, demodulate with a really long memory. So this is all pretty interesting. We can generate frequencies also higher than that in the lab up, up to about 26 and a half gigahertz, we can also generate, I can generate higher and I'll show you in just a second, but really n I have no way of analyzing and generating signals between 26 and a half up, up until about 110 gigahertz, which will be essentially the millimeter wave region that most people are interested in. So I thought, well, what's the cheapest way that I can go about getting equipment broken or from eBay or from other sources to generate millimeter wave frequencies in the lab. Of course, you can go and buy millimeter wave generation components and you know they can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars if you were to really buy a state-of-the-art Keysight or Roden Shorts or so on. So what's the cheapest way? Well, one of the units I do have is this 20 gigahertz synthesizer. This is a sweep generator. This is an HB 83752B. It had some minor issues. It wasn't that exciting for a repair video, but this is working now. So what can I do to go from this to millimeter wave frequencies? So let's investigate and see what's the cheapest way to do it. So before we look at some of the equipment, I just want to mention one other thing. So here's a gig oscillator. This gig oscillator does work between 20 to 40 gigahertz. So you may be tempted to say, well, why don't you use one of these gigs that you've used in one of the previous videos? Well, the reason is because this is still an unsynthesized source, meaning that there's no PLL around it. So in order for me to lock it to a particular frequency and have a stable operation with good phase noise, I still need a PLL around this and it's very difficult. These things are complex multi-loop synthesizers and in order to get this frequency you need to have the proper uh, dividers and then a reference and it's just a, a mess. So if I were to use these, I would be essentially making a test instrument from scratch and anyway the amplitude itself wouldn't be leveled. I would need VGAs or attenuators for it. So this is not the route that I wanted to go. I wanted to use something that's already in the market but not too expensive. So it took about a year to get all the components necessary for this video. So first I got these guys. Now these guys are obsolete devices that HP used to make and these are millimeter wave sources and they come in a really wide range of frequencies. And the principal operation is fairly straightforward. They multiply the input frequency by a ratio. It could be double, triple, quadruple, times six, times eight, and so on. So this particular millimeter wave source goes from 26 and a half to 40 gigahertz. And if you look on the input side, it has a type N connector, which accepts uh, from 13.25 gigahertz all the way to 20 gigahertz so times two, that gives you the range frequency at the output. Now they do have this connector, a property source module interface connector that has this uh, weird kind of a multiple pins and a, and a center pin which I think th they use for amplitude leveling and we'll take a look at it hopefully when we take it apart. And then that's how it communicates with whatever it is connected to. But unfortunately, the source I just showed you at the beginning of the video doesn't have this kind of interface. So that was the first hurdle. Uh, even if I wanted to use this reverse engineering, this connector is just out of the question. Now the output of it, over here it has a, a waveguide interface, so we would need also waveguide to coax converters if you want to use it in coax mode, because I don't have a lot of waveguide components, especially because this flange type you know, is not something that I would be able to easily find, or if I do, it'd just be overly expensive for no reason. Now, this is one of the ones that I found. Now, the other one is even higher frequency, and this one goes between 40 to 60 gigahertz. And the principle is exactly the same, except that this one multiplies by three. So 20 gigahertz ends up being at uh, 60 gigahertz and 13.33 or so, I forget what exactly the frequency was, uh, is the lowest, but it goes a little bit below 40 gigahertz as well. So 40 divided by three would be the, the lowest input. So yeah, as you can see, it would work uh, quite nicely. It has a different flange, waveguide flange, so there's a different connector, but you can see it's much smaller than the other one, as to be expected, because they do have different frequency of operation, different bands of the waveguide. So that's great, so why don't we just use these, but now we have to find something to interface with them. 
And check this out. After doing some search, I finally found a really clean uh, version of this instrument. This is a 20 to 40 gigahertz amplifier, exactly the range of frequencies that we would need for those devices. And this is an HP 8349B. And I got this for about $150, which I think is a really good deal. There's a lot of these available on eBay, but they're not in really good shape. This one was a very clean one. And the nice thing is that this has its connectors at the front, so you just give it RF input and RF output, and it gives you the power level that's reaching the output. But it does have the source module interface right in the front of it. There's a plastic cap on top of it right now. It's kind of stuck, but once I take this off, you will be able to see it. There you go. I think I got it. So this uh, cable, this interface exactly matches the interface of those millimeter wave modules. Now, once you connect that to this, this kind of actually switches from showing the power level instead of the uh, at the RF output port, it shows it directly uh, what is the power coming out of the waveguide. So it switches over to that, which is a huge help because you can actually do amplitude leveling and measure the amplitude that's coming out, the power that's coming out, so we can measure to see if that's actually accurate or not. And to make it even more interesting, I've managed to find this cable, and this cable can connect uh, directly to the back of this instrument, and we take these two, which is the uh, 0.5 volts per gigahertz frequency reference. Oop, I don't think I'm showing that and the external leveling back onto the 20 gigahertz synthesizer. So then the 20 gigahertz synthesizer can do amplitude leveling of directly the millimeter wave source. So you can create a, a chain which then allows you to reach millimeter wave frequencies and generate them directly from a 20 gigahertz synthesizer. And what you will get out of it is then a properly leveled synthesized output uh, for the modules that I have anywhere from 26 and a half gigahertz all the way up to 60 gigahertz. Now, the modules that go between 60 to 110 gigahertz were way too expensive to buy. So I'm still hunting for those ones, see if I can uh, find them. But if you do, then you will have a full set from 26 and a half all the way up to 110 using the same amplifier set at the same synthesizer, the same cables and everything. So that is a huge advantage. So on the detection side, things can get a little bit more complicated. So on the MXA, we know that we can use a smart mixer, which connects to the external mixer input output of the MXA and the USB port to give you analysis up to any frequency you want essentially and up to 110 gigahertz with Keysight's own smart mixers. Now after Keysight moved away from the old architecture of the PSAs and so on into the X series spectrum analyzers, they changed the external mixer from a two port to a one port. The two port external mixer connectors had the LO coming out on the IF going in. So you had a two port connection which would connect to these old mixers. And I actually those are the kind of mixers I found on eBay to buy. But the new ones have only one port, meaning that there is a diplexer inside the instrument which separates the LO from the RF when you connect the smart mixer. And the smart mixer has a USB connector so it configures the instruments automatically. All the loss calibration coefficients are automatically embedded into the measurement and when I reviewed this instrument I showed you how that works. So well after searching on eBay I did find these mixers. So here you go. Uh, smart mixers are essentially unaffordable for hobbyists and so on because they're so expensive but these ones you would be able to find. So this particular one is a harmonic mixer and this one goes from 26 and a half to 40 gigahertz so that covers one of the millimeter wave modules but if you look carefully you can see that it has two ports. It has an LO port and an IF port, which is incompatible with the MXA because we don't have the two connectors going into it. So we have to have an external diplexer in order to account for the fact that the MXA has only one port on its mixer. Well, after searching for that for a long time, I eventually found one from some Italian seller that sold me one for about 100 euros, 150 euros, I can't remember. And I'll show you that I also have another one of these mixers. So this mixer goes from 40 to 60 gigahertz. But check it out. Now there is a diaplexer connected to it. This diaplexer is made by OML. This is the DLP313B. And all it does is that it separates the LO and the RF from each other and it puts it into one port. So it's a bidirectional thing, of course. So then the LO coming in this way goes into this direction and the IF coming back goes into that direction. So that's how you get a diplexer. So I've already combined that with a higher frequency mixer just to show you what it looks like. So now we have only one interface port which we can connect directly to the mixer input of the MXA. So now the combination of this, unfortunately every time you want to use the two mixers you have to take this one off and put it on this. Uh, but of course that, that's just two connectors that you need to separate directly here at the body of the mixer. So now we have a 40 to 60 gigahertz down convert mixer 
and we have a 26 and a half to 40 gigahertz tank convert mixer. These two frequencies match exactly the two millimeter wave sources. They are the opposite of that. So with this, with the giving these two, given the MXA, with the 20 gig synthesizer, the two millimeter wave source modules, and the microwave amplifier, we now have a complete set of instruments in order to create and detect and analyze a millimeter wave frequencies up to 60 gigahertz. So now I don't know if any of these things work because these are all sold as you know not knowing whether they work or not. So we have to test them one step at a time. And I thought that we would take some of them apart as well. So why don't we start with the simplest one. We can pair the A349B directly with their synthesizer here, with this one, and see if it makes any sense, if it's working, if the power levels are correct. We can use a power uh, sensor and a power meter to measure the output of the amplifiers, if it matches and if it works in the range it's supposed to. If that works, we can go step by step, layer by layer, and build our source and see if the whole system comes together. So a quick look at this amplifier module, and it is really nice and clean inside, even though these things are pretty old. One of the problems with uh, getting these units that have been in the storage is if people aren't careful and just throwing them into the storage, for example, this particular unit, if it's stored upside down, dust and even debris and potentially water can get in because there's holes at the bottom of the chassis and then seep onto the, uh, all these motherboards and then you're, you're finished basically at that point. But you can clearly see the different divisions. Here's a main power supply there. You can have some adjustment potentiometers on it. All the capacitors are responsible for filtering main transformer over here. This cable going to the back is the cable which we will use with that other uh, interface cable I showed you so that we can transfer the ALC amplitude leveling directly onto the synthesizer. Hopefully that works, we have to try that. The main section over here that has a unique serial number as part of this module is the amplifier module and the detector module uh, that you can see over there. There's a cable coming out on the detection, detection side for the VGA. So looks pretty good. I think I, I would say everything is pretty clean, nothing unusual going on. I think it looks good enough for me to be able to just go ahead and turn it on for the first time and see what happens to it. Here's our first test. I have set the source here down to 15 gigahertz. Output is set to zero dBm. Now the output of the synthesizer goes to a mechanical attenuator and the reason for that is because this instrument is not equipped with a mechanical itinerary itself. So the lowest output power it can provide is minus 10 dBm. And that's not low enough for us to be able to create a wide range of powers from this amplifier because it has quite a bit of gain. So now we have this itinerary set to 20 dB attenuation. The output of this is set to 0 dBm, 15 gigahertz, and it's not enabled, so there's nothing being shown on this display. This simply means that the power coming out is below minus 10 dBm or so, which of course is expected because the source is disabled. We have a power meter here directly connected to the Agilent N192A, right over here. And you can see that I have set that instrument to measure 15 gigahertz. It's automatically calibrated by, by the power sensor itself. So everything's already set up. It's cal and zeroed and all that. So it's minus 31 dBm, which is the noise floor of this particular power sensor. So everything makes sense so far. So now what we want to do is enable the power and see if we get anything on the amplifier. So here we go. Enable. And it says zero. So that means that at 15 gigahertz, this instrument has about 20 dB of gain, which is correct. That's what it's supposed to have, and uh, that is if this power is correct. So about half a dBm is coming up. Now, the accuracy of this power meter built into this instrument is supposed to be plus minus 0.3 dB. If it's within that, then we're good. And check it out, 0 .0, 0 0.5 dBm, and we're reading 0 0.5. 4 dBm roughly. So it's actually really good. It's surprisingly accurate and it is detecting the power correctly. It is only obviously done at what one frequency here at 15 gigahertz and at one alpha power, but it is very, very good. So let's go ahead and increase the power coming directly from our synthesizer. I am going up by, let's say, let's go up by 10 dBm. So I'm going to put it at 10 dBm. Here we go. And it went up by almost exactly 10 dB. And if you look there, it says 10.55 dBm. And on the source here, we have 10.7 dBm. So it is surprisingly good. So I don't need to do any calibration on this. There is a whole procedure to linearize at the behavior of this instrument and make sure the logarithmic detector has a good linear dB performance. But I tested it at several frequencies and it is very, very good. So I'm quite happy with that, I think this will work very nicely for us. So now the next step is, what happens if we connect this amplifier instead of connect, connecting it directly to a power sensor, 
rather directly connected to one of the millimeter wave modules. And we can try directly with a higher frequency one. I don't think it matters. Uh, then we're going to try the other one as well. But I'm also eager to take one of them apart and see what's exactly inside of it. Let's set that up, test it, and see what happens. And here we are with the millimeter wave setup. Now things are a bit more complicated now, both in terms of measurement and of course the setup. So I'm going to measure the higher frequency version first. So remember this goes from 40 to 60 gigahertz. I have configured the synthesizer here to 16.666 all the way. That would be once multiplied by three, that will translate to 50 gigahertz. So we expect the output of the millimeter wave module to be at 50 gigahertz. I've connected it directly to the amplifier. Right now this source is disabled and you're seeing nothing there. The amplifier, the attenuator at the output of the source is still there because I want to make sure that I can control the power going into the multiplier carefully. The reason is because these units can put out many dBms of power and we have to be careful because uh, this particular mixers that I'm using, these mixers have an input compression of about minus 7 dBm typically. So if I put anything more than minus 7 dBm into here, it's going to compress the mixer and we're going to get completely wrong readings. Now I don't have a power sensor that goes up to 50 or 60 gigahertz that I can connect here, so we have no way of measuring the output power like we did with the output of this amplifier. We're going to have to try and measure the spectrum directly. So I have it connected here. There's a waveguide to coax converter. I have one 60B attenuator, which I can place here. This is the only 60B attenuator, or the only attenuator that I have that goes above uh, 20 gigahertz. So this one actually goes up to 60 gigahertz. I have a V cable connected to another uh, waveguide coax converter. So we have two waveguide coax converters back to back. We have a cable and a 60B attenuator. So this loss of this entire system at 50 gigahertz itself is at the very minimum about 12 dB. So let's say we have 12 dB of loss in here, which means that we are now fairly protecting the mixer so that it, we can generate you know, fairly high output powers and still measure something reasonably accurately. I have the diaplexer directly connected as I showed you earlier and there's a single cable that goes to the MXA. So now we have to configure the MXA to accept an external mixer as opposed to the front end 50 ohm input and once we configure that then we should be able to go ahead and enable this and see if we can actually get anything show up on the spectrum which would mean that the multiplier is working, the down convert mixer is working, the diaplexer is working, uh, these are the only things that we haven't tested and normally you want to test everything layer by layer. That's why I tested this first and I tested this first, but then I cannot test these in pieces because I have no, nothing else to feed them. Therefore, I have to test them in a chain. And you know, if one of them doesn't work, you don't know which one, but there is no, we have no choice. That's what we have to do what we have. So let's go ahead and look at the screen, configure it for an external mixer, and we can then see if it produces any signal. So let's configure the MXA to accept this external mixer. And the nice thing about the, this being an HP mixer is that the people who wrote the operating system for the MXA, even though it's a really old harmonic mixer, they knew people might still want to use it with an external diplexer, which is exactly what we are doing. So they've programmed that in there for us. If I go to input output, I can change this to an external mixer. And if I go under mi mixer setup, you can see that under here there's a category 11970, that's the model number of this particular mixer series. And it comes from A band all the way to W band, which is 110 gigahertz. Now the mixer we're using is 40 to 60 gigahertz, so it's a U band mixer. And we can select that, you can see it goes from 40 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz, and it's a 10th harmonic mixer. It has a huge noise figure, of course. It has a huge conversion loss of about 25 dB of conversion loss. So having said that, we can go ahead and close this. So there it is. Now we're looking at from 50 gigahertz to, uh, uh, this is center at 50 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz of span. That's from 40 to 60. I don't like the way it shows that. So there it is, from 40 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz. So we're looking at exactly the right place. Now we can go ahead and enable the source and see what we get. And I'm going to move the camera a little bit here so you can see the screen of our amplifier there also. Now here's the nice thing about the combination of these three systems together. Once you connect the millimeter wave module with the cable directly to the front of this amplifier, the power reading here is no longer the power coming out of this, even though that's what it is if there is nothing connected. So this, is, this intelligently switches between showing the power at this port when nothing is connected, but it shows you the power at this port when you connect it directly to it. So this is a really nice uh, module from that point of view because you get a power sensor built into your source and that is used of course for automatic leveling. And we'll see if we can do that. So right now the source at the bottom is turned off. 
So you, we're going to get nothing at, down here. Now this only starts showing stuff at minus 10 dBm. So at the beginning we won't see anything anyway. So let's go ahead and turn on our source, which is set to its lowest power, minus 10 dBm. And there's a 20 dB attenuator in front of it, so the power is pretty small. Let's go and turn it on. Do we see anything on the screen? Ah, there you go. That's excellent. That's really promising. Now we can see the different tones. Now this is a harmonic mixer, so we are seeing all the images. So we should go through the settings of the instrument and turn on signal ID so that the, the instrument would intelligently get rid of the other images. Now it does that by shifting the LO ever so slightly, looking at where these tones travel, make multiple measurements, and eliminate the ones that are images and not the real signal. There it is, perfect. So now what do we expect this to be? Well, if the source coming in is at 16.6 .6 gig times three, that should be our 50 gigahertz signal. So let's go ahead and see if that is true. We're gonna do a peak search and perfect, look at that, 50 gigahertz. That is excellent. And the power reading is minus 56 dBm. So if you go over here, oh, I'm zoomed in way too much. If you go over here and look at the system that we have, see if that number is even remotely correct. Uh, well, we said we have 6 dB here is about, let's say, 10 to 15 dB of loss in this lane. Let's say we round it off and say about 12 dB of loss here. 12 dB plus 25 dB of loss over here. That's 37 dB of loss. Let's make 36 dB of loss. That would mean that the power coming out is about minus 20 dBm. Well, that's, that seems reasonable. Now, minus 20 dBm is not going to show up on this display because it doesn't show anything mi less than minus 10. So why don't we increase it until we see minus 10 here and then see if the power still makes sense. So I'm going to increase the power. And look at that. That's nice. This is going up with it. We're going to keep going. At some point, I should see minus 10 dBm. Come on. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Let's increase a little bit. There is minus 10 dBm. That's amazing. So here's, if this is minus 10 dBm, now we are reading minus 44. So now minus 44, about 34 dB of loss, that's minus 10 dBm. So it's actually working correctly. So the power appears to be in the correct place, which is great. Now we can do 10 dB more here, bring this to zero, and see if this goes up to from minus 44 to minus 34. And at minus 34, we, we know we have zero dBm coming out of the multiplier. So let's go ahead. We're going to increase that until that goes to zero dBm. And there we go. There's zero dBm. And check it out. Minus 34 dBm. It's perfect. It, is, it works really, really well. Now we can see some <laughs> other harmonics showing up over there. Now those harmonics could be from anywhere, uh, potentially from, let me turn the signal ID on. Let's see if those are still there with the signal ID. Sometimes the signal ID can get a little confused. Oh boy. Okay, so some of those might be from actually nonlinearities of the mixer too. Yeah, you know what? That's, that must be it because if I'm measuring minus 34, no, the input of the mixer is still above the zero dBm compression point, or the uh, P1 dB compression point. So it's okay. It should be about my, it should work up until minus seven dBm at the input of the mixer. So it works really nicely, but I can't really increase it too much beyond that because I don't want to push the mixer. But I also want to know what is the absolute maximum power that this multiplier can give me. So is there a way to find out? Well, there is a trick we can play only because we know this number is accurate. If this number is accurate, and I want to make sure this number at 0 dBm is accurate, is it also accurate at very high numbers? The only way to know is by separating these two from each other and actually creating an over-the-air transmission and make a reference measurement at 0 dBm and then increase it beyond that. And if nothing moves, then you have the same transmission through the air. You should be able to make uh, the higher power measurements. And the separation here is just basically we're making an attenuator over the air. We're using the separation between the two waveguides as an attenuator. Now that might seem a little bit confusing, but let me set it up, it's gonna become all clear. And so this is what I did here. I created this, a gap between the two waveguides. Now of course, a waveguide with nothing connected to it would, be, would make a really poor antenna, but it still works. And um, the waves leaving the surface of this waveguide, some of them will be captured by the opening of the other waveguide. You will have a big loss there, but the important point is that even though we don't know what this loss is, we know that it is a fixed number because nothing's changing. So then I can increase the power continuously and this will act as an attenuator protecting the input of the mixer. The only danger of doing something like this is that, of course, this is an open all of a sudden, the 50 ohm line is gone. So s waves will reflect back into 
this waveguide as well. And they're going to go back to the input of this. And I have a 60B attenuator, so that's going to give us some protection. It's going to absorb some of the reflections, so it, it won't be able to build up too many uh, in the cable. But nonetheless, this should be good enough for our measurements. You know, for low powers like this, it's not that big of a deal. And these things are designed anyway to operate even when they're open. So let's go ahead and see what we can do with it. So right now we're at 0 dBm, nothing's changed. And the, the signal has become significantly smaller. So let me move this out of the way here so we can get a better look at the tone. And I'm going to increase it and see uh, how much higher we can get this. What is the maximum power that I'm able to actually get out of this unit? Now we know that the number appearing on our amplifier is accurate. This number is accurate. So let me put that in a corner of the screen. There we go. We can go ahead and increase them at the same time. Let's keep going. There we go. 2 dBm, 3 dBm, 4, 5, 6, 7 dBm or so. Now we can't go any more at some point because I have a 20 dB attenuator in front of it. So let me go ahead and actually back this off a little bit and turn the, I'm going to go all the way down to minus 10 and I'm going to set the attenuator to zero. Now we can really push it. So right now with the attenuator at zero and minus 10 dBm going into the amplifier, we're at three and a half dBm. How high can we go here? Let's see. That's a lot of power. There we go. It looks like we're saturating at around 8 dBm. So 8 dBm is quite a lot. So we're getting 8 dBm up around 60 gigahertz. That's a, you know, a reasonable amount of power coming out. Of course, we cannot connect that to our external mixer directly. The external mixer can take a lot of power. It's just that it won't be very linear with 8 dBm going into it. And it seems to be working quite nicely. So I'm very happy with the setup. The only other thing I want to try is the cable to see if I can do automatic leveling of the millimeter wave source directly with this cable. And if we can do that and that works, then we're going to go and take one of these guys completely apart and see how this manufactures inside. Now I'm going to open the lower frequency one because this one has more value and it should be about the same because they're really all the same architecture, just different level of multiplication. So I think that would be pretty cool to see inside one of them. So let's do this last experiment and then we take it apart. And indeed by connecting the signal coming from the back of the amplifier to the ALC input and selecting the source module as the source of the ALC. The instrument does automatic leveling and the amplifier no longer shows you these dots mean that the display is being remotely sensed. So now you no longer have to worry about leveling this yourself. Whatever power you put into here, the instrument will correctly adjust the power coming from it into the multiplier and everything is taken care of with the ALC loop running between all of the modules at the same time to give you 0 dBm as you requested. So now we have a completely leveled frequency locked synthesized millimeter wave source between 26.5 and 60 gigahertz. All of these instruments uh, all work together to make this happen. So it's a really nice system. Now of course the phase noise of the system, the purity of the harmonics and all that is not going to be as good as a state-of-the-art unit, but it is going to give us uh, a reasonable amount of accuracy for the kind of stuff that we want to do here in this lab. And let me show you a couple of little quick things about this gap over here and what kind of things you can place in between. You can actually measure the loss of various materials at millimeter wave. So let's try putting a couple of things in between. So I'm just going to place various material here in between these two paths so we can see the kind of attenuation experienced at 50 gigahertz. Now at 50 gigahertz the frequency is fairly high, skin depth is pretty shallow, so anything that has any conductive material in it will completely block the signal. So let's start with my finger. Now my finger is going to have obviously blood in it and lots of salts in it, and the, the fluid in my finger is highly conductive, and it's going to get absorbed into my finger. So let's go ahead and put my finger in front. You can see I can almost completely block out the signal. Now the power is not very high, so I won't feel anything, but as you can see, we can attenuate it quite a bit. This piece of plastic, I'm going to put that in the middle. It does a little bit of attenuation, but really not that much. Uh, this, this plastic is almost completely transparent at 50 gigahertz. Another thing we can try is some ESD bag. The ESD bag is optically transparent, somewhat transparent, but it is metallized. So we would expect it to attenuate 50 gigahertz. We can try it. We can put it in the middle. And there it is. As you can see, yes, indeed, it does attenuate the signal at 50 gigahertz. So this is very interesting and it gives us an opportunity to measure various kind of materials in the future. And you know, leave some comments and let me know what kind of experiments you want me to do uh, with these modules. But I know you all want to see what's inside one of them. Let's go and take it apart. 
Okay, let's see what we have here. So I've taken the screws off. So this should separate, I think. Here we go. And there it is. Yep, that looks exactly what we would expect to find in something like this. So it has several sections, and clearly an amplifier front end, and followed by a piece which is the multiplier plus the final amplifier. So here's the input. You can see it twists around, goes into this module, some kind of a preamplifier, maybe. And then there is a piece that connects at the bottom, right there. You can see into this main uh, component, which ends in waveguide. So I'm really curious about what these pieces each do. So we can take it out of this casing completely and then analyze and see which one is worth taking apart. I don't think this is going to be very interesting in particular. If it's just a preamplifier, it's only going to be amplifying signals between about 10 to 20 gigahertz anyway. It might have a lot of Apple power though, which it probably needs in order to drive the final doubler. And this is the 26 to 40 gig version, so we expect only a doubler here. The one that we've been testing so far is a tripler. Now everything else in there is going to have to do with power detection. I see a lot of potentiometers on the other end uh, to do linearization of power measurement, biasing, optimized biasing for lowest harmonic generation, and so on and on. So let's go ahead and flip to the other side and see if I can take this whole thing out of the box. And let's carefully separate this from the connector as well so we can take that last piece completely away. Uh, it's a bad angle. Let's see if I can open it. I have to, sometimes you have to loosen it the other way, uh, just a little bit push it the other way so that it loosens up. Here we go. So that should give us the ability to isolate this piece completely. There we go. That helps. Now, normally when you open these, you have to be very, very careful. These are extremely EST sensitive, especially the detectors. So let's take a look and see if we can get any hint on what is the front end here. Mm, there's a part number there. I can definitely look up the part number and find out if the front end is just an amplifier. Most likely it is. So let's go and check the part number and see what it is, and then we can decide what to do next. All right, getting step by step closer. I couldn't find a lot of information about this online. I just did a very quick search. I'm sure there was something. Uh, but once we open this one, we will be able to find out what this actually is. Now, in order for this to also house the doubler, uh, the interface between these two would be at a much higher frequency. So I'm still skeptical. But once we open it, we'll find out. So I opened it on the side where it has all the screws. The other side is where the interface actually goes to the other board. You know what? Looking at this is interesting. From this module, there's quite a few connections to the back. But from the other module, there's only two. One there and one close to my other finger. Interesting. So there's not much circuitry biasing happening in this one, which leads me to now doubt a little bit about what's going on. Because if the maybe this is just the detector, it could be that this is just a detector, and that's why it only has two pins, and that's the diode, and it does the conversion to waveguide. In which case, this is actually the doubler. Interesting. So, you know, a little clues here and there, but uh, until we open it, we wouldn't know 100%. I still really want to see what's inside of this. All right, I got all the screws out. Now, I have opened hundreds of microwave modules, and this is one of the most beautiful and interesting ones I've ever seen. Uh, so this is not aluminum, this is steel. So they have uh, machined this out of stainless steel and this thing weighs a ton. And check out how beautiful it is, it's crazy. So I just have you know, looked at it for about 30 seconds or so and I wanted to record this as quickly as possible so we can brainstorm this at the same time together. Now if you look here, you can see the trenches are all cut out and machined out, absorbers again in some critical places. But we really have to look at this to appreciate what they've done here. So the signal coming in here is converted from coax to waveguide with a Vivaldi-like structure into this trench, which is the waveguide trench. And that trench just goes to the output. This is half of the waveguide piece you can see over here. And this is the half bottom, half rectangular opening. But this is also a detector, as I suspected. And they have a piece over here which bridges the two halves of this coupler. And the way the couple appears to be through these little squares that you see, they're actually connected to each other, deposited on this quartz or glass material, and that leaks some of the signal to the other side. At the other end, it appears that they have another Vivaldi-like structure for absorbing the waves going that way, so that there is no standing wave ratio. It's like an essentially an absorber. It's like a termination. 
And on the other side, they convert back to coax and looks like a diode detector here, which then they detect the power, and that's how they aptitude level it. So they only partially couple the power. This is normal. This is how most of the time it's done. It just seems so crazily engineered. And the, on the front here, there is another diode or some other component. Now, it, this could actually be the doubler itself. It could be that they're just doubling it over this diode and then filtering it out, whatever they don't need, uh, which is itself very interesting. And this waveguide wouldn't support uh, so the frequency is below 26.5 gigahertz very well anyway, so there's some inherent filtering from the waveguide structure itself. But this could be something else. I'm not sure. We have to open the other block to really understand what it is. But this is just crazy. It, first of all, it's really beautiful to see the effort gone into it. The cost must have not mattered at all uh, for doing something like this. Looking at this. Uh, quartz pieces and then metal deposited on them. It's interesting to see the two different colors. Maybe it's the different face of it being exposed. But man, this is this is amazing. Uh, just the, the coupler is <laughs> just a crazy coupler. I mean, I don't understand why they didn't make a leaky waveguide. Um, interesting, very interesting stuff. So this is a this is not how you would make something like this. Now integrated circuits are so much better. You wouldn't even do this in waveguide. You just do it in ASICs, and at the end you just convert to waveguide if you need to. This is a, a Unfortunately, I, I'm tempted to say almost obsolete in some ways, but the techniques are still completely valid, uh, but the cost of making some things nowadays would be minuscule compared to what they've spent to build this. So now we can go ahead and take a look at uh, this component here and see if I can open it. Hopefully that's accessible, uh, but this is the diodes are extremely ESD sensitive. That's why I didn't separate it from this board. Inherent protection from whatever is connected to the other board, and this is of course an ESD mat on, uh, underneath it. So let's close this back up. I don't really don't want to get dust in there and damage it, but man, isn't it beautiful? And I really have to test it afterwards again just to make sure it doesn't get damaged. Uh, this line that you see here, uh, I did that by trying to uh, push some knife underneath it to separate them because it's sealed so well over time. And I'm sure that opening it and letting... Oh, no, actually, you know what? Um, you know what? I, I might have... Th this might have been a bad thing to do in some way because now I've exposed it to air. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantage, one of the advantages of coupling this way is that it's sealed, almost hermetically sealed, I think. So I hope that I don't destroy it by doing it, doing that. Uh, it air can enter here, but maybe not on the other cavity, uh, which uh, although there is a you know coax line there, so maybe it's not so bad. Anyway, we will not know immediately. Anyway, these things take time, but very cool. So let me close it back up. Look at the other end of it. Okay, let's take a look and see what we got here. And. Ah, that looks good. There you go, there's our absorber. So luckily the absorber is now in the lid uh, and not on this. And you can see this is also hermetically sealed. So opening it is really not a good idea. But anyway, for science, we'll take a look. We'll try and close it as quickly as possible. And that will uh, help uh, protect it. So let's go and see what we got here. And there's a lot of components there. And this is all discrete, of course. Uh, this, um, I should say it's semi-discrete. It's multiple integral circuits discreetly assembled. Uh, it's hard to see really like this. I think this is one of those things we need to put under the microscope to really get a, a good look at it. And here is the amplifier under the microscope. And uh, I think it's just an amplifier based on what I'm seeing here. So the signal actually shows up here. That's the input. You can see some matching and some filtering. Uh, some stops over here and then the signal arrives at this power splitter and they have an entire amplifier here you can see I've talked about these kind of amplifiers many times before and there's two branches there then recombine back over here and then we got some filtering yet again and this filtering is probably very important to make rid of to get rid of all the harmonics that are undesired because they will then multiply and mix with each other and you get any even more tones so all of this structure is to prevent that and then you have another amplifier batch and exactly the reverse um, combining again splitting and combining so it's essentially the same structure now if you look at this amplifier and we compare this amplifier with the first amplifier they're, they're similar and I don't think there's much of a difference between them actually and so that's why I'm thinking that uh, this is not multiplying anything and this look the little cute arrows that show you the way the signal flows it's, it's neat and it's obviously assembled under the microscope by hand so the arrows really help making sure and nothing is connected in the wrong orientation. And then the output, they recombine again, and you got some butterfly stops uh, that send the output out to the final connector. So I don't think this is doubling. That means that that very first component that we saw in that waveguide module most likely is the doubler, and that's how you get the second harmonic. Now I'm really curious how the tripler actually works. But if I'm missing something really obvious, 
uh, please feel free to let me know in the comment section. But considering the size of these uh, combiners and splitters, these Wilkinson combiners and splitters, the fact that they're the same size and the input and the output, uh, it would tell me that this is not multiplying anything. And uh, whatever is happening is happening at the output of that. So this must be a fairly high power amplifier, ensuring that there is sufficient power going into the doubler to, first of all, clean it up also, and uh, get rid of all the harmonics, as well as uh, getting rid of uh, putting enough power into the doubler to create a meaningful amount of energy coming out of the double of the frequency, which is, which is really kind of unusual to think that only a set single diode could produce enough power, because you'd have to put a ton of power into a diode so that the second harmonic is as big as it was. We, we were getting 8 dBm at the triple of the frequency. Maybe this doubler doesn't have as much power, but I doubt it. So anyway, let me know what you think in the comment section. This is a very, very interesting uh, circuit and a very interesting module to take apart. And I hope you learned something about millimeter wave generation and some of the different components that are out there, taking a look at some of the architectures of how they've done it. If I get my hand on a state-of-the-art version of these, it'd be very cool to take a look and see the comparison, see how much the technology has evolved. Obviously, I make millimeter wave circuits all the time, and they're all fully integrated, you know, all the way up to 200 gigahertz or so. But this is very interesting to see how people do it, uh, how they used to do it, when they didn't have access to such fast process like we do today. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comment section.